the literature at the AB. We are delighted to have you with us and also to have our eminent and dear guest, Professor Charles Burnett, who will deliver this year's Anise Matlisi Memorial Lecture under the title Transmission of Knowledge Across Religious Boundaries in the Middle Ages. Dr. Burnett is a prominent academic authority on the history of the Islamic influences in Europe. He is a distinguished professor at the prestigious Warwick Institute, University of London, and directs the Center for the History of Arabic Studies in Europe, Chase. He has been a member of the Institute of Advanced Studies at Princeton, a Liverpool Research Fellow at the University of Sheffield, a distinguished visiting professor at the University of California at Berkeley, and visiting professor at the Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich. His very vast, influential oeuvre has centered on the transmission of Arabic sciences and philosophy to Western Europe, which has been uh, documenting through uh, editions and translations, texts that were translated from Arabic into Latin, and analyzing the historical and cultural context of these translations and transmissions. Please uh, join me in extending a warm welcome to Professor Bernard. Thank you very much, Naga. I hope you will excuse me when I um, quote Arabic because my Arabic isn't very fluent. Um, I do have a handout which may or may not be useful for the talk. Um, I hope that what I say will be clear and interesting. What I would like to address this afternoon is the impact of religions on the transmission of scientific and philosophical learning in the Mediterranean world in the Middle Ages. This sounds an enormous subject, but in fact, the simple answer as to what effect did religions have on the texts of works translated in science is very little. What I'm talking about is the transmission of Greek learning in philosophy, mathematics, medicine, and magic into the Islamic world and thence into Western Europe. In the first stage, occurring mainly in the eighth, late 8th to the 11th, early 10th century in Baghdad, it was predominantly Christians, Nestorian, Church of the East Christians, who were doing the translating for their co religionists or for Muslim patrons in Baghdad, Conayn ibn Ishaq, his son Ishaq ibn Conayn, and his nephew Kubaish, and Kushta ibn Luka were all Christians, as were many of the doctors of the period. Later in the 9th century, Thabit ibn Qurra, a consummate mathematician and astronomer, translator and reviser of the works of the Hunayn school, came from Sabian stock, if he wasn't a Sabian himself, wearing a totally different hat from that which he wore when translating Ptolemy, Euclid, etc. He described, this time in Syriac, the religion of the Sabians, a planet-worshipping sect, who attributed their holy scripture to Hermes. In turn, Yahya ibn Barmak, a patron of the translators, was of Buddhist origin. His grandfather was the custodian of the Nauwacher in Bach, a present-day Afghanistan, um, a very important Buddhist shrine. And the conduit through which texts in Sanskrit on medicine, astronomy, and moral tales reached Baghdad. Translations with were also made from Middle Persian, um, for example, and by Masha Allah, who happened to be a Persian Jew, and by Zoroastrians. From his kunya al Majusi, the Majus, it is clear that Ali ibn al Abbas al Majusi, the 10th century Arabic medical writer, had a Zoroastrian background. As for the transmission of the same texts, often the same texts from Arabic into the Western European languages, occurring mainly in Spain between the late 11th and the mid 13th century, many of the translators into Latin were Christians. But Jews helped them to interpret the Arabic. Ibn Daoud, who helped Dominicus Gundis Salinas translate works of psychology, a certain Solomon, the wisest of the Jews who helped Alfred of Shersil understand mineralogy, Aphelius Abaumet Judeus, a son of Abaumet the Jew, who was also described as being nevertheless a good man, Provus Vir, who had Salio of Padua translate a work on astrology from Arabic, or from Arabic. 
texts are attributed to Jews, a work on the astrolabe is described as being what Abraham Ibn Ezra dictated. Abraham Bahia translated a work on trigonometry that he had originally written in Hebrew, Arabic material. A large corpus of works on the science of the stars and on magic was translated into Castilian by Jews in the court of Alfonso X, King of Leon and Castile, in the third quarter of the 13th century. The most prolific of these Jews were Judah ben Moses and Johann Daspa. The secular sciences, by their very definition, steered clear of race and religion, one would expect. Nevertheless, we do have some statements that imply that race and religion may have got in the way of a smooth translation. Transmission. This is the statement by Ibn Abdun, the market overseer of Seville in the early 12th century, who told the market traders that, I quote, they shouldn't sell to Jews or Christians books concerning science because they translate them and attribute them to their co-religionists and to their bishops. Later in the same century, Barkia Hanakdan, an Oxford Jew who translated Adelard of Bath's natural questions from Latin into Hebrew, wrote in his preface, I was worried about translating these subjects since I found them in non-Jewish writings, but they were originally translated from Hebrew into Latin, and I wished to cleanse the subjects from the defilement of the Gentile and restore them to the holy language. Of course, this is a complete fabrication. The works were never written in Hebrew. They were composed originally in Latin. Could science then belong to a particular race or language? Said Al-Andalusi, in his Categories of Nations, written in Toledo in the late 11th century, categorized nations into those who possessed the sciences and those who did not, and differentiated between the kind of sciences pursued by the Indians, the Persians, the Chaldeans, i.e. the people of Mesopotamia, Greeks, Romans, including the Western European nations, Jews and Arabs, distinguishing them into those um, of the, uh, distinguishing the Arabs into those of the Orient and those of Al-Andalus, um, regarding, as he would, <coughs> the Arabs of Al-Andalus as being superior in the sciences to all of the races. But he also referred to races uh, and peoples who were ignorant of the sciences or who were just not good sciences, scientists, including the Chinese. But in relating different sciences to different races, um, Zai did not make any religious distinctions. But did different nations have proprietorial rights over the sciences that they produced, or different religious communities uh, regard that sciences belonged to them. One way of circumventing proprietorial rights was to claim that the scientific learning arose in times which far preceded the divisions of religions into Christianity, into Judaism, into Islam. A tradition deriving the science from a legendary distant past was developed by the adherents of the Shu'ubiya, pro-Iranian movement, within early Islam. Abu Sahr al-Fadl al-Nawbacht, um, who, as the name suggests, had Persian origins, wrote that the many varieties of science descended from Babylon to Egypt and India the knowledge of astronomy and astrology is especially associated with Jam, the son of Awan Jahan. Afterwards, he continues, there ruled Dachak ibn Kai in the period of Jupiter, and he built a city named after that planet in Iraq. In this city, he constructed 12 palaces named after the 12 signs of the zodiac, and installed in each a library and a group of scholars. He goes on, this is quite a long quotation, he goes on to say, the greatest of these scientists, Hermes, abandoned the city and went to Egypt, where he became king. He brought with him much learning, though most of the wisdom remained behind. When Alexander invaded Persia, he raised al madain and uh, destroyed the stones and pieces of wood bearing inscriptions. However, he had the Persian manuscripts in the treasure houses and archives of Persepolis translated into Greek and Egyptian before they were burnt. The translations were sent to Egypt, 
that on the advice of their prophets, the Persian prophets, Zaradusht and Jamasp, earlier Persian kings have concealed copies of those books from the confines of India and China, where they escaped the ravages of Alexander the Great. Iraq then was without learning until the reign of Ardashir ibn Babak, the first Sasanian emperor, who sent to India, China, and Rome, Byzantium, for copies of the lost books and had them translated back into Persian. And he goes on to say this, um, building up this picture of very ancient, of the antiquity of sciences, which far precedes any of his contemporary religions. We find a similar strategy for attributing hoary antiquity of science in the writings of Herman of Carinthia, a translator of works on the science of the stars from Arabic into Latin in the mid 12th century. And I would like to dwell on Herman's words a little, um, one aim of which is to justify translating from Arabic into Latin, from Arabic the language of the Muslims, of the infidels. In his preface to the book on the essences, the essences, a text on the universe and man based largely on Arabic sources that he had translated. He refers to the joint enterprise of his fellow translator, Robert of Ketton, and himself. Our most earnest neighbor acquired from the depths of the treasures of the Arabs is what they want to reveal to the Latins. He, said, he decides that the essentials of this Arabic knowledge must be revealed to the people at large. He starts by describing the primordial cause in words reminiscent of one of these books, The Great Introduction to Astrology of Abomasha. The primordial cause is one and simple, and while being motionless, is the cause and reason for the movement of everything else. For reason shows that that which is not in motion precedes in antiquity all that it has moved. He goes on to say this, to develop this idea. But then, having expressed the difficulty in discovering the primordial cause, the first cause of everything, Herman states that man is helped towards understanding it by divine revelation. In fact, God condescended to man to such an extent that, I quote, he came down utterly to the level of humanity. Herman, of course, is alluding to the incarnation of Jesus Christ, since he's addressing a Christian audience. Herman wants to leave the development of this point to the theologians, but cannot resist putting forward an argument against the Muslims. He quotes against them a phrase in Arabic which he transcribes in Arabic, Ro Allah wa kalimahu. And those who have the handout will see these quotations in passage one. Um, putting over the Arabic words, the spirit of God and his word. This is clearly a quotation from the Quran, Surah 4, verse 171. Uh, and his word that he cast towards Mary and the spirit from him. But it is interesting that Herman quotes the Arabic words implied by the translation of this passage um, by his fellow translator, Robert of Ketan, who in fact made the first translation of the Quran De nuncius suus for spiritus et verbum Mariae politus visum existit. So Jesus Christ was the um, was the messenger of God, and His Spirit and Word um, sent to Mary um, from on high. Herman chastises the Muslims for not accepting that Christ is God and for asserting that an impostor was placed on the cross in place of Christ. But Herman goes further. It is easy for Christian theologians to argue on fideist grounds that Christ was God. A stronger ar argument can be taken from astronomy, and here he puts forward the description of the constellation Virgo, one of the signs of the zodiac, in which can be seen in the sky, he says, a pure virgin nourishing a boy and feeding him with her milk in a region called Hebrea, with a man sitting beside her but not touching her. The point that Herman is making here is that there is a sign from nature rather than from mere belief or revelation. And the facts of nature can be accepted by all people, whatever their religion, as it was by the wise men from the East who recognized the sign in the heavens, and by Abu Mahshar, the Muslim, who relates this description of the constellation Virgo in his great introduction to astrology. 
Above all, the facts of nature precede the revelation of the Christian and Islamic religions. These things, as Herman says, were known to foreign nations from the time of Abidamon, king of the Indians, whose disciples were Hermes and Asclepius, and whom the Arabic historians concerning the first authors of astronomy mentioned long before Porus, who was the contemporary of Alexander of Macedon. Herman would have known the Quran since Robert and he had been commissioned to translate the work together with several other pieces of Islamic literature by Peter the Venerable, who wanted to have the material with which to refute the Muslim. Robert, in fact, refers to the same Muslim in mis misinterpretation of the divinity of Christ, this time in Latin translation only, in his preface to the translation of the Quran. Um, Herman refers to another passage in the Quran in which Christians are accused of believing in three gods. This also is in your passage in one. Um, reflected in Herman's words, um, not as the Ismailite, the Muslim believes, um, a triple god. But what is important is that science provides firmer testimony, a testimony which is likely to be accepted by all peoples, than does the revelation to a specific people. Therefore, one can take scientific learning from any source. And that is Herman's justification for taking his work on cosmology, his own doctrines on cosmology and astronomy, um, from the Arabs in his work on the essences. Nevertheless, this hoary ancient learning um, on natural science in all its varieties um, picked up some elements of the religions through which it passed in transmission from Greek into Arabic, from Arabic into Latin. And these elements could not always be accepted without adaptation to the religion of the receivers of these texts. Kunayn ibn Ishaq deliberately glossed over or change the references to pagan gods in the texts he translated from Greek. The Greek gods became angels, monarchic. Thus, Aphrodite, Pandemos, the common Aphrodite who predies over human love, in the Arabic translation of Artemidorus's dream book, became the angel Aphrodite who belongs to the people. In the Hippocratic Oath, Apollo the healer becomes God who grants life and health. A parallel phenomenon can be observed in an Arabic version of On the Nature of Man, written by Nemesius, a fourth century bishop of Emesa, Homs, in which all the Christian elements have been left out. The opinion of the Hebrews concerning chaos becomes that of certain people, whilst the Bible becomes certain books. And even God, you would expect God is uncontroversial, but even God becomes wisdom. Perhaps there's a hair attempt to make the science, science independent of any revealed religion. What happens when Arabic texts are translated into Latin or a Western European vernacular? Sometimes the religious elements are retained, especially in the case of literal translations. And indeed, in the 12th century, um, the, uh, the height of the um, period uh, of translations from Arabic to Latin the literal method of translation became the norm. There is a chapter on finding the direction of Mecca, Qibla, in the work of Costa ibn Luca on the spherical astrolabe, though Costa himself was Christian. Um, he was writing, obviously, for Muslim audience. And this chapter is retained in the Castilian translation made by a Jew under the auspices of Alphonse X. In the work on the rise of sciences, the phrase le ilah, le alach, there's no God but God, is preserved. Uh, you can see it in the passage 2, um, Deus Christus, when known as Deus, God, other than whom there is no God. The same phrase is translated by Gerald Cremona, the greatest of the Arabic Latin translators, in an alchemical text on alums and salts. In slightly different words, Deus sine quo non est Deus, God without whom there is no God. Deus Stevitz, in another alchemical text, reserves a typical Islamic resort, Al-Alam, 
and the Eden Allah often occurs in astrolog astrological works in the form Deo Annuente, such and such will happen with God's permission. The Basmala, which precedes every Arabic text in the name of God the Merciful and Compassionate, is regularly translated as in nomine, Domini Misericordis et Dei, in the name of God the Merciful and Pious, or Misericordis, Compassionate. Although we sometimes find a Christian formula substituted in nomine Domini Jesu Christi, there should be no problem about God, who is the same for Christians and Muslims alike. But what happens when the translator is confronted with the phrase that often or regularly follows the Basmala, God's blessing on Muhammad and his family and companions, and grant them salvation or the like? One possibility was just to be leave this phrase out. But such was the desire of the translators to be faithful to the original text that they were unwilling to leave anything out that was in the Arabic. So they faced a dilemma. In Abu Mashar's great book on historical astrology, the Kitab of Duwal wa Mila, translated as the Magdis Conjunctive Omnibus, or on the Great Conjunctions, uh, in two versions, an original and revised version, the ending in Arabic, as one would expect, is completed with the help <coughs> and the support of God. Praise be to God only, and God bless our Lord Muhammad and his family and companions and grant them salvation. We find this in passage 3. Both the original Latin translator and the reviser have no problems with the references to Allah, translating the first phrase as completus est cum laude dei et auxilio eos, completed with the praise of God and with his help. But in what follows, they have maliciously substitute, substituted maledictio for benedictio. The curse upon Muhammad obviously caused compunction in at least one early scribe or reader of the revised version who crossed out the last phrase in its entirety. And this is what I've done on your handout passage three. I feel very embarrassed about actually bringing this subject up here, but it arises out of the feeling that you've got to include uh, one Latin word for every Arabic word in the original. And if that Arabic word cannot be translated into Latin literally, then it has to be substituted. Another phrase in which Muhammad's name sometimes occurs was a reference to the era of the Muslims, the Hijra commemorating the departure of Muhammad from Mecca to Medina in the AD 62. Abu Masha gives a horoscope of the conjunction of Saturn and Mars in the sign of Cancer, in the year of the Hijra of the Prophets, upon him be peace. Hijra Nabi alayhi al salam. Here, the two Latin versions of Abu Masha's on the Great Conjunctions differ considerably. The, re the revision simply refers to Principium Elevationis Prophetae, the time of the accession to power of the prophet. A good translation of Hijra, not a literal translation. The original translation, on the other hand, puts a negative interpretation upon the departure of the prophet, calling it a repulsus, a casting out, and gratuitously adding et odium and hatred, while again substituting maledictio for benedictio on the prophet. So here we have a revision which glosses over this um, blasphemy against the prophet. In other cases, instead of leaving out, sorry, in, 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 instead of finding a substitute um, for the Arabic text, references to religious or cultural items are simply omitted. Dr. Nicolaus Hasse has pointed out that in Averroes' great commentary on metaphysics, one of the largest com commentaries on an Argentinian work written by the great um, um, 12th century um, Arabic philosopher, Ibn Rushd, the translator Michael Scott has omitted many phrases, whole sentences, and sometimes whole paragraphs. Among the passages missed out by Michael are uh, things relating specifically to the um, Muslim religion. 
um, or to Muslim, specific Muslim philosophy, uh, for example, a kind of kalam, which is called in our time the science of the Sharia. The Sharia of the philosophy, of the, of the philosopher is to investigate all beings, since this is the most noble way to worship the creator. And another passage describing the grammar of negation and affirmation in the Arabic language, which contains two quotations, illustrative quotations from the Quran. Hassi's conclusion is that Michael Scott was convinced that his Latin readers were not interested in the matters of Islam and of Arabic language. But for the rest of the talk, I would like to concentrate on two other pieces of evidence um, in the um, transmission of Arabic texts to the, the West. The first comes again from Abu Mashal's On the Great Conjunctions. Um, this text belongs to the genre of astrology, which is most closely associated with real history. Through the conjunctions of Saturn and Jupiter and other recurring astronomical cycles, one can predict what will happen to nations and religions. The book includes accounts of the conjunctions indicating the birth of the prophet, the Islamic religion, that of the Hijra, and the shift of the dynasty from the Umayyads to the Abbasids. Islamic history is divided into 30-year intervals by the conjunctions of Saturn and Mars, and the succession of caliphs is related to the succession of the planets in descending order. So, and the prophet is attributed to Mercury, Abu Bakr to the moon, um, and finally Abu Abbas as Safa, the first of the Abbasid caliphs, um, is again attributed to the moon. In the Latin version, most of the names have been corrupted beyond recognition, and one would not regard on the great conjunctions, they might be conjunctionibus as a source for medieval Western knowledge of Islamic history. One section which was understood, however, was that which referred to the correspondence of different combinations of planets to different religions, and this is what I would like to focus on. The most significant indications for religions is that of the mixing of Jupiter with each of the planets in turn, when Jupiter is in the ninth astrological place. I don't need to go into details as to the meanings of these technical terms. I translate the Arabic text and add the Latin translation, noting the variants of the revised version when they are significant. And here, if you like, you can follow the passages um, on your handout. In passage 4, if Jupiter mixes with Saturn, it indicates the faith of the people of that religion in Judaism, which is similar to the quality of Saturn, since the other planets apply to it, but it doesn't apply to any planet among them. Similarly, the people of all other faiths agree with Judaism, but Judaism does not agree with them. And this is translated quite literally into Latin, no problem here. Um, the, uh, the words in Latin are the same as those meaning Latin is the same as that in Arabic. But when we come on to, um, when we come on to the next um, planet, uh, Jupiter mixing with Mars, um, we find that this is associated with or indicates um, Mazdaism, i.e. Zoroastrianism, the state religion of the Persians, the religion of fire. So that, uh, that is why it naturally belongs to Mars, the god of the planet of fire. And the Latin translator translates Majusia loosely as pagan. The translation, uh, we, we find this translation of Majusia as Dentilis in other context as well. So again, the Latin is quite close to the Arabic. If the sun mixes with Jupiter, this is passage 5, it indicates the worship of the planets, raven images and idols. And here the Latin, again, is quite close to the Arabic, um, except there's an, a convenient gloss um, to the sculpturae, yeah, the, sculpturae the, um, the, the, the statues, um, a gloss which gives the Arabic word anida, which is obviously related to nid, um, and a quotation which is very close to a, a phrase which is very close to a phrase in the Quran, which I quote in my passage here: and um, And so, um, you should not uh, make any equals to Allah. 
um, and here in Latin we have um, anida, meaning those things which are made equal to the Creator. So this shows some knowledge um, even of Islamic, or probably of the Quran, or of the Islamic religion, on the part of the glossator to this translation. It becomes a little bit more um, um, dicey when we get to the next one, if Venus mixes with Jupiter. It indicates the revealed religion and monotheism, like Islam and the like. Venus is the planet of Islam. So what does the Latin translator do, do with this? Um, first of all, he seems to um, um, confuse two words which are very similar in Arabic. In fact, his uh, Arabic manuscript might already have this variant. Instead of Zahira, the revered, he had before him Tahira, clean. So Saturn um, indicates, um, the Venus indicates the clean religion. Um, but Secondly, he does not um, hide the fact that this clean religion, which is also the religion of unity, Tahweed, is the religion of the Saracens. Um, he doesn't introduce at this stage any um, criticism um, uh, of, of Islam. He translates Tahweed as unitas, which bears the connotation of the oneness of God, just as Trinitas is used for the threeness of persons. But then we come to Mercury, this is passage 7. If Mercury mixes with Jupiter, it indicates Christianity and every faith containing antipathy, Jafar, doubt, shock, and trouble. This is how it is in the Arabic. What does the Latin translator do with this? Again, he seems to have slight variations in his Arabic text. Instead of Jafar, he has Kafar. Um, very similar in, in just a matter of dot being above instead of below the line. Um, and he translates this as hiddenness. Um, and also instead of shak for doubt, he says it has shad, um, which is seriousness. But this doesn't make any difference. He doesn't, he doesn't in this way, make Christianity more attractive. He still says, if Jupiter is combined with Mercury, it signifies a Christian faith, and every faith in which there is hiddenness and seriousness and hard work and trouble. So, um, so he's not glossing over this um, rather derogatory description of Christianity. So far, we have seen a noble attempt by one or more translators, the original the reviser of one of the great productions, to reproduce the exact meaning of the Arabic. But this account is hardly acceptable for Christian consumption. How could we say that Christianity is characterized by antipathy, doubt, and trouble? Or even by hiddenness, um, seriousness, and trouble? Can one get away with retaining the favorable references to Islam? Sometime in the mid-13th century, Abu Masha's account was used by a poet who pretended to be Ovid, writing in the first century BC, producing a poetic novel called De Betula on the Old Woman. For Venus, the author wrote, and you have to imagine now, uh, being um, in Rome, just before the advent of Jesus Christ. If Venus mixes with Jupiter, now it is proved to be our faith, describing the Roman's faith, in which anything whatsoever is thought to be allowed as long as it's pleasurable, although a written law concerning this is not to be found. And then there's a gloss, <coughs> evidently written by the author himself. Mohammed wrote this law down a long time afterwards in the book that is called in fact, this is one of many instances in which the pagan religion of the Romans, in which Venus features very prominently, a religion of uh, um, uh, without law and illicit, uh, where well, anybody can do what they like, is identified with the religion of the, of the Muslims. For Mercury, the pseudo of it, uh, the author of the day eventually wrote, but because Mercury has so many orbits and so many forward and backwards movements, 
that's law, Christianity, will be more difficult to believe than all of them, being very onerous and burdensome. Laying down very many precepts which fly in the face of nature but can only be conceived by faith. Therefore, much doubt and many a knotty question will arise among many people. But because Mercury is the indicator of writing and calculation, he gets this from another source, the that, not the source, through which every law has to be established, and especially because it will promise not marvels in the present time, but the conveniences of eternal life, it will be defended by so many very subtle arguments that it will always stand firm and strong until the last law of the moon destroys it, along with the others, or at least suspends it. So here he's taking this literal translation from the Arabic and try and turns it so that it becomes um, uh, so that it becomes um, supporting of Christianity. And we find this is done in a very similar way by the famous English scientist and educational reformer Roger, Roger Bacon in his Smiles of 1268. So here we have, I summarize, an example of a translation being reasonably faithful to a a translator being reasonably faithful to his original text, the translator according to the norms of the 12th century laid down in antiquity by Boethius must not impose anything of himself, let alone his own religion, onto the text. <coughs> but the readers, in this case the anonymous author of Dave Etula and Roger Bacon, can then bend the meaning of the translation to suit their own ends. And it is here that religious and national considerations, ethnic considerations, show themselves most conspicuously. The second and final example comes from the last chapters of the Metaphysics of Avicenna, um, the last book of the Shifan, the Cure from Ignorance. Since this is Avicenna's own take on the Metaphysics of Aristotle, it deals with the same subject that we saw Herman of Carinthia dealing with at the beginning of his work on the essences, being as being, the difference between essence and existence, the first cause of God. But at the very end of the text, Avicenna devotes several chapters to the means by which not only individuals but the whole community can come closer to God. This has to be affected by a legislator, Sani or Shari, who provides the binding rules for the community, the Sunnah and the Sharia, the customary procedures and the canonical law, and who is, of course, the prophet, Nabi, a remarkable person who is closest to God and in whose hands lies the power to appoint the successor, Khalifa. The last three chapters of Book 10 of the Metaphysics are replete with Islamic religious language, with the duties of the Muslim to pray, Salah, to fast, that sound, to fight for the faith that he had, to go on pilgrimage, hajj, with the laws of marriage and divorce, the Sharia and the Sunnah. Avicenna, of course, in keeping with the purpose of the Shifa as a whole, establishes arguments for the necessity of the Prophet and of laws for the community. His argument for praying and pilgrimage, for example, is that, use back and mild words, translation, Certain areas of land must be designated as best suited for worship and as belonging to God, exotically he. Certain acts which people must perform, as for example sacrificial offerings, must be specified as belonging exclusively to God, exotically he. For these help greatly in this connection. Should the place that is of such a benefit contain the legislator's home and abode, this will be a reminder of him. Remembrance of him in relation to the above mentioned benefits is next to importance, next in importance only to the remembrance of God and the angels. Now the one abode cannot be within the proximate reach of the entire community. It is therefore fitting to prescribe a migration and a journey to it. So this is the rational explanation of Hajj. Avicenna doesn't name the Prophet or give any historical details, aside from referring to Umar and Ali in the whole of these three last chapters. But he ends the book and the whole of the Shifa with statements of religious exhortation. Um, this is passage 9. Whoever combines theoretical wisdom with justice is indeed a happy man. 
And whoever, in addition to this, wins the prophetic qualities, becomes almost a human god, a rab in Sadi. Worship of him, after the worship of God, exalted be he, becomes almost allowed. He is indeed the world's earthly king and God's deputy in shit. <coughs> this resonance resonates wonderfully with Islam as a philosophical corroboration of Muslim faith. But what happens when it passes into Latin? For the metaphysics was translated sometime between 1160 and 1190 in Toledo by Dominicus und Sadinus together with an unknown collaborator. In the first place, perhaps, there is no harm in Christians regarding prophets as being exalted human beings. And in Latin, there is no need to distinguish a prophet from the prophet, especially not from the prophet with a capital P. You just can't distinguish these three in Latin. So the third chapter starts in Latin with the words propheta non estare, a prophet is not such a being as recurs time after time, for the matter which receives the perfection of such a man is found in few temperaments, therefore a prophet, or should we say the prophet, must write down rules to ensure the permanence of what he has decreed. The second sentence in Arabic <coughs> is quite clear that the prophet is the prophet by adding salaf alayhi, alayhi wa salam, God's prayers and peace upon him, which is conveniently omitted in Latin. This is all passage 11. But that is not the whole story, because it is omitted in two Arabic manuscripts too. So Gundis Salinas may have been faithfully following the Arabic manuscript in front of him. He was, as the others, a very literal translator. The Shifa of Avicenna, in fact, was introduced to Toledo by a Jew, Abraham ibn Daoud, fleeing from the Almohads who had brought an intolerant regime into Al-Andalus. So the pious phrase may have been erased, by Jewish copyists, or the pious phrase may be an addition in the Islamic transmission of the text. In any case, whenever it appears in the Arabic text, this pious phrase is absent from the Latin. On the other hand, the pious addition to God, to Allah, is always present, gloriosus et artissimus. The religious duties of the Muslim are quite compatible with those of the Christian. Prayer, orationes, fasting, ye union, fighting against the infidels, expugnare infideles, I'm using the words that Buddhist Salinas used. The pilgrimage, ire in peregrinationes, and lex et consuetudo, law and custom, um, are a neutral translation of Sharia and Sunnah. The one direct quotation from the Quran, good deeds drive away bad deeds, this is passage 10 on your, on, on your handout, um, sounds innocent enough in Gundis Salinas' Latin setting, Ideo dixit propheta veritatis quod elee nocinae tolerant peccata. Therefore the prophet of truth said that acts of mercy remove sins. Note that in Arabic the equivalent of prophet of veritatis is al ir al haq one speaking the truth. Propheta has been introduced here in the Latin. Some of the detail of legislation in the Arabic text are glossed over or omitted, that women, women should wear the veil and be secluded from men, um, becomes, therefore, women should be kept behind doors and curtains. Um, and details about sexual relations between men and women have been omitted, perhaps out of prudery rather than religious scruple. In relation to the succession, some details have been uh, about the instances in which a caliph can be deposed, and the references to Umar and Ali have been omitted. The final section about the godlike man, however, was hardly changed at all in the Latin. And I quote the, um, an English translation of the Latin, in wh whomever there comes together with these virtues, speculative wisdom, sapientia speculativa, he becomes happy, Felix, and to the one who is given the properties of prophecy, perhaps he will become a human god, Deus Humanus, whom it is allowable to worship after God, because he is the king of the earthly world and the vicar of God in it. 
that is your passage 11. So I end up by saying what I said at the beginning, that in the transmission of the secular sciences and of philosophy, the religions of the translators had very little effect on the text that they translated. But of course, that's not the whole story. Even one and the same text in different cultural contexts can have different nuances. As Jorge Luis Borges demonstrated in his story about Pierre Menard, who, in the 20th century, tries to translate Don Quixote as closely as possible and ends up writing exactly the same words that Cervantes wrote. But in the early 20th century, these words have a very different significance than they did in the early 17th century. Similarly, a prophet is not one whose life recurs in every period, has a very different ring in the ears of an 11th century Muslim than in those of a later 12th century Christian. To take up the image that Nader and Misri chose for the poster advertising my talk, one could say that there is a subtle alchemy working on the meaning of the text which does not manifest itself in words. Sometimes it is left to another scholar to bring that changed meaning to the surface, as we have seen in the author of the De Vetula in respect to the literal translation of Abu Mashar's On the Great Conjunctions. At other times, we are obliged to insinuate that meaning ourselves. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this very rich contribution. And I find it wonderful to have all of these quotations from Latin shared with us here. Mm -hmm. uh, and we open now the session for uh, your questions and comments. elaborate a little bit on how Venus came to be associated with the religion of Islam. The microphone. Yeah. Is there a microphone? Yeah. This is an interesting question. Um, it is obvious that is, the Venus is associated with the religion of Islam because um, their holy day is Friday, which is the day of Venus. Um, this was very convenient for um, critics of Islam um, because one of the main criti criticisms um, by Europeans, by Christians, of Muslims, of Muhammad in particular, was that they were very prone to lasciviousness. Muhammad had 40 wives and the innumerable con concubines. This was because he was a vertical of Venus. So the association of Venus and, and Islam is there all the time. To what extent, I mean, Muslims, as you see, um, regard Venus as their planet. As the, um, and, um, and then there is this um, strange connection between um, the Venus, that is the planet of Muslims, and the Venus um, who is worshipped by the ancient Romans. Um, but at the moment, all I can say is that um, the association of uh, Islam with, uh, with Venus is tied up very closely to that of worshipping um, in Friday. Yes? Thank you very much for a very interesting lecture. I just wanted to make a small note that this problem of translation, if it goes to 16th century Germany, I mean, Luther based all his salvation on faith by adding one word, Rome. So you are saved only by faith. This yes. only does not happen in the Vulgate no, no, no. or in the original. Yes. And yes. Luther added it, and he made a whole religion out of a single word, word that he added, translating the Bible. Thank yes. you very much. I just wanted to make that <laughs> notice. Yes. If, if, if I had the time to go into the relations period, Luther's period, in fact, um, 
I could have said something a little bit different because um, the, when all these texts were translated for, um, on science and philosophy from Arabic into Latin, the Arabs were regarded as being superior to the Europeans uh, as scientists, as mathematicians, as astronomers, uh, as philosophers, and the European, and also as being the true inheritors of ancient Greek philosophy, Aristotle in particular. Um, and therefore, um, um, translators um, looked, made a great effort to find and translate um, all these works by Aristotle, by Rose, by Avicenna, Al Ghazali, Al Farabi, from Arabic into Latin, because this was the cutting edge of research. Um, then, of course, in the Renaissance, there was a reaction, especially against the Arabic interpreters of Aristotle. Why read Averroes when he couldn't even read Greek? You know, go straight back to the uh, go to the Greek, go to the sources, uh, and if you have to, you know, Greek interpreters rather than Arabic interpreters of Aristotle. And it was only at this stage that scholars started to say, why read a work of a Muslim? It's at that stage that the, that the religion comes in. But when you are saying, you know, this is great astronomy, this is great philosophy, and so on, you're not going to say, but it's written by Muslims. Mm. Yes. Maybe a foolish question, but following up on, on Dali's question. Uh, is it possible that Venus had some connection in the, to, to Muslims as an aspect of uh, navigation and, and so on? Or it, that has nothing to do with it? Or and where does the name come from? Or what's the Arabic name for Venus? I don't know. Ah, okay. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, no, I mean, I'd like to ask uh, um, Arabs or Muslims just what the kind of connotation of Venus as the morning star, as the giver of light. Um, I mean, there's a positive Venus and there's a negative Venus. Um, and just as, uh, just as Aphrodite in, in Greek has the positive side, you have the celestial Venus and you, and you have the, um, the Venus of the people, the earthly Venus. And the earthly Venus is all about love between men and women, or between men and men. The celestial Venus is all about love on the universal cosmic level, um, which is one of the um, driving forces of uh, um, of the whole world. So um, Venus as a light giver, as a light bringer, is a, is a very positive sign. Um, and so, so the Christian critics of Muslims brought out the negative aspect of Venus, but Muslims would bring out the, the positive side of Venus being a planet. Yes. Following on the subject of uh, Venus and Magda Muslims, the early Arabs, the yes. Jahiliyun, the Islamic Arabs. Yes. We know that there were cults which worshipped Venus, and this was preserved in the name which occurs often, which is Abd al-Zuhra, oh. the, the slave of the Zuhra, yes. of Venus. I don't know whether there's any connection with this, but yeah. the, it may be worth mentioning that there was this cult uh, which is very well preserved. Yes, yes, and Venus might have been identified with one of the pre-Islamic gods, I suppose, or, or um, Yes, yes. I mean, Ishtar, of course, is very important in the, in the Zoroastrian um, cosmos. Mm -hmm. I have a very technical question first. In your example number seven, oh, uh, when Jaffa becomes, in Latin reading, Hafa, yes. and Shak, Shadda, yes. so it's that. It's a, it's a reading problem. It's a reading problem, yeah, it's in here. Yeah, yeah the translator hasn't altered it. Okay. He's just read what he's found. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. and, and this is one of the interesting things in, in looking at the translations in detail, that, um, that you have variants in the Latin which reflect different pointing in the Arabic, <laughs> points in different places. Um, or you have a revision in which somebody seems to have had access to a different Arabic manuscript with slightly different readings, but you can see, uh, you can sort of trace the history of the, of the, of the Arabic manuscripts, as an editor, as it were, um, by just looking at the Latin and indeed the Hebrew translations, which also reflect um, the Arabic, because they're so literal, so you can um, guess 
at every single word which the translator had in front of him because he didn't miss a word out and he generally um, always translated the same word, the same Arabic word by the same Latin word. just curious about the Sabanians and their influence and, and also the connection between Hermes and Idris in yes. Arabic. Well, indeed. Anything a bit more on that topic? Uh, it's, it's an enormous topic and uh, certainly the connection is made. Hermes, that's the Greek word for the god, Idris, or the sage. Uh, Idris is the Arabic equivalent, Enoch is the Hebrew equivalent. Um, and uh, as for the Sabians, uh, that's what I really Nadel probably can be more, um, say more about this than I can, but um, there's just a, a, a new volume published in the, um, well, the, the final letter of Ikwan the Saha, which mm -hmm. is on magic, and that has a whole section on the doctrines of the Sabians. And the um, editor of this work, Gokhrati um, Kalatai, uh, includes in his introduction quite a detailed account of who were the Sabians. And I mean, the traditional idea is that they lived in Haran and they built temples to the planets and they worshipped it. And each temple was built in a different style and, and each temple was associated with um, different ceremonies, with different um, um, wearing different clothes, um, um, making different sacrifices and so on. Um, but we have other um, indications that Sabians, um, the word Sabian was used for pagan philosophers in general. And a Buddhist could be just as much a Sabian as an Egyptian philosopher. Um, so we have Sabians and Sabians. But, um, but there is quite a clear cut um, body of doctrine which involves making talismans worshipping the spirits of the planets, um, measuring, regulating your life according to astrological considerations, which can be described as being Sabian, but the, the actual transmission of this knowledge is still very um, uh, obscure. And, and another very personal question, and as I'm being involved in translation from Christian theology to Muslim contemporary oh, theology, yes, yes. so it just a strong, it just arises my curiosity in how far the term Isa ibn Maryam yes. that has been translated without any comment here. Yeah. So today, I, I can tell you that is much more difficult. Uh, so a term like Masiya yeah. would uh, normally be translated as Jesus, the son of Miriam, yes. which you would not you know, expect to meet in a Christian no, version. No. Yeah. So there is here a very you know, light-hearted spirit at work. Yes. I can't yes. explain that. Comparison also isn't isn't very fair because we talk about uh, very very different contexts. Yeah, but still, it's striking. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, I mean the, the Christian translator could very well have, how to say, Dominus Dominus um, um, Noster or something. Couldn't be our, our Lord, you know. But he doesn't. He just translates it exactly as it is in the Arabic. Um, and uh, the curious thing about Herman of Corinthians' reference to Abu Masha's alleged um, seeing of the uh, prediction of the birth of Jesus Christ in the sign of Zerah of Virgo is that there you have Esau, um, but it's been conjectured that this belongs to a tradition of astrological uh, description of the constellations. Um, um, in which Esau is a corruption of Isis, because of course it's from Egypt that and much of this consolation law originated. 
So if anything, um, the, yeah, the Arabs have already Christianized um, um, a pagan Egyptian and tradition of astrology and, and introduced Jesus where he lived to not have been. Excuse my ignorance, but what, what is the theory of translation? You mentioned such such extreme attention to detail. So, did did this come out of practice, or did it come out of well, uh, some no, theory? No, yes, uh, yeah, yeah. it certainly had, had theory behind it. Um, in fact, to a Herman, whom I just referred to. Um, um, in one of the um, prefaces of, uh, of a translation, the preface to one of his translations, apologizes for occasionally not being very literal. Um, when he says he and his colleague, Robert Ketton, should be following the method of Boethius. And so um, this method of Boethius is invoked in the 12th century. And if you go and look at Boethius's um, introduction to his translation from Greek of um, Porphyry's commentary on the um, um, on the categories, we see um, um, Boethius saying, "I do not in, 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 in translating these philosophical texts. Um, I am not following um, uh, the way of the orator who." Um, makes beautiful Latin um, out of the Greek, but rather of the fides interpres, the faithful interpreter. Um, and this term comes from the law court, where the testimony of witnesses um, have, has to be translated absolutely literally. And we're thinking of the Roman Empire, in which people spoke all kinds of different languages. Um, and um, Boethius justifies, his, justifies using the, the sense that this method of the fides interpres, where what is important is the rays, is the matter, um, rather than the beautiful speech. But there's a whole tradition here that's taken up in the Middle Ages of, um, of what is the best way of translating. Um, and um, um, Burgundio Pisa, who was also translated from Greek at the same time in the first century, um, he's translating theological works. And he says that in theology, when you're dealing with sacred texts, or commentaries on sacred texts, it's even more important um, not to put anything of yourself into it, but making sure that you follow um, the exact words of the writer, the original author, um, even the same order of the words, because there is something sacred in the order. I have another question, please. Uh, so, the findings of your research, it, could one be so bold as to push it to a conclusion and say that neither race nor religion mattered, ultimately? Or would that be too too explicit a statement? Well, um, yeah, it's it's, it's um, in so many subjects, it's irrelevant. Religion is irrelevant anyway. If you're translating a Euclid's elements, you know, work on geometry, there's nothing. There's no religious elements of the work. What's, uh, what's a little bit more, uh, maybe I'm a bit confused over this, but the end of the metaphysics of um, the sheep of Avicenna actually deals with religious subjects, and that's another matter, really. And then you, you have translations of the Quran itself, Robert of Ketan was translating the Quran. But even if you look at the translation of the Quran by Robert of Ketan, he is very faithful to the original meaning. Um, and he even uses tafsir, um, um, Arabic commentaries, to get at the original meaning. His profession as a translator was to 
reveal what was in the original text, not to comment on it. The person who commissioned the translation, Peter de Venerable, then uses this translation to write his Summa Contra Saracenus. Yeah. He has no, uh, this, uh, and, and that is, he doesn't pull any punches, he really does criticize this Muslim um, completely. But the translator, if he's doing his job pro properly, is leaving aside his religious views that he's doing in the translation. Take one more question. Thank you, Professor Bernard, for this very erudite lecture. I would like to know about your view uh, uh, about the beginnings, the prehistory, let's say, of this, uh, these different translation movements. Is there, um, before the official translation movement started, have you to uh, assume a kind of transfer of knowledge that preceded it? I just uh, thought of uh, Fahmi Jan'an's uh, work who speaks about, a, 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 he calls it a um, diffuse, a diffuse, yes. non-focused venue of, uh, of transfer. Yes. Or uh, lately, more lately, a uh, very interesting work by um, uh, Sidney Griffiths appeared, he uh, calls it um, the, the work is the Bible in Arabic, and he focuses on something that he calls the interpreted Bible, so kind of vernacular pre, uh, let's say pre-translation Bible, kind of uh, biblical tradition enriched by homilies and so on, yes. which was uh, the basis of everything else. And he claims that the entire idea of translation is due to the authority of the Quran, which um, initiated or which pushed other religionists to yes. think about translating their heritage into Arabic. And uh, it's an interesting, uh, I would love to like to know what you uh, think about the transfer of knowledge pre-translation. Well, um, yeah, that's, that's bound up with um, the question of why do people translate in the first place? Yes, yes, and you were sponsoring the type of translations, uh, why was it necessary to translate? And um, speaking only of what I know of the Western um, tradition, um, it is, one might say, surprising that the Arabs entered Spain in the early 8th century. Translations didn't start to be made until the late 10th century and didn't really get going until the 12th century. Um, if you look at the 10th century translations, they're not really translations. They are just picking up um, Arabic ideas and astrology and on um, the astrolabe, how to make the astrolabe, to such an extent that somebody who has written recently about these early astrolabic texts in Latin says that um, these are not translations at all. They are notes taken from um, a demonstration of an astrolabe, probably by an Arabic master. Um, so, so one could say, I suppose, that preceding these almost professional translations, which are in the 12th century, which are made so carefully, um, leaving nothing out and so on, you do have a, a period in which there is interest um, in Arabic, um, and we're talking about Arabic science and philosophy, um, which um, trickles through to a certain extent in the way of these notes on the astrolabe, these, were, these notes on astrology. Um, but, and this very um, um, acquaintance with this knowledge then makes people want to um, translate the whole text um, and get a, a full picture of the, of the science. Um, as for what happens in the religious, on the religious side, um, we know exactly why um, religious texts were translated from Arabic into Latin, because Peter Verrill um, commissioned them. Um, and then we have uh, also all this um, uh, evidence, no, well, before that though, we have all this evidence of most Arabs um, not actually translating, uh, translating parts of the Bible in, from um, Latin into Arabic. Um, but especially annotating in the margins um, of Latin manuscripts, uh, just translating odd verses of the, of 
people are battling. And that is something which is we are still getting to know really what the Mozarabs were doing um, um, in, um, as Christians in Al Andalus um, um, confronting Arabic texts. But uh, uh, well, the um, the idea that you brought up from Sidney Griffiths is something I'd like to follow up. Um, thank you very much for this uh, scholarly session. It's a pleasure and a privilege for us to be here. Thank you very much.